Welcome to Pier Glass Poetry Spotlight number nine, where we will visit one poem and its author. I'm Stan Galloway, your host, and today we'll be looking at Holding On by Melanie Hyoin Han. It's good to be with you today. Thanks for having me. Melanie is coming to us today from Seoul, Korea. She is the author of Sandpaper Tongue, Parchment Lips, out last year from Finishing Line Press. Holding On comes from that collection. Melanie, would you begin by reading the poem for us? Yes. Holding on. In the house at 6 degrees, 46 minutes, 43.121 seconds south, 39 degrees, 15 minutes, 51.031 seconds east, I was sexually assaulted for the first time, but I didn't know how to tell my parents, so the boy continued to come over to play. And in the house at 6 degrees, 43 minutes, 42.651 seconds south, 39 degrees, 14 minutes, 13.59 seconds east, my mom got cancer, then got depressed, then tried to kill herself, but I didn't know how to be there for her, so I disappeared to escape. And in the house at 6 degrees, 44 minutes, 50.505 seconds south, 39 degrees, 16 minutes, 41.829 seconds east. I heard a splash at night, but I didn't know what to do. So when I found a body face down in the pool, bloated and purple, I threw up and sobbed. And in this house at 42 degrees, 24 minutes, 0 0.033 seconds north, 70 degrees, 59 minutes, 40.553 seconds west, I realized that I never had a normal childhood, but I didn't want to believe it. So I lied to myself to feel better for just a little longer. Yes, uh, thank you. This poem deals with some terribly difficult events in the first person. In writing the poem, you employ several distancing techniques, uh, the first two of which are visual rather than audible, and those are the large spaces between the stanzas uh, alternating and alternating between uh, flush left and flush right for each of the four stanzas. Talk a little bit about how you arrived at those decisions in arrangement and what messages they might send. Yeah, so first of all, when it came to the placement of the stanzas on the page itself, I wanted it to take up space. I felt like it deserved to take up space based on the experiences that these events had in my own life. And I wanted it to be distanced and separate because they were big separate events that happened and yet all part of one big whole thing that shaped a bunch of my childhood. And so by placing them on different sections of the page, I just wanted to represent that spatially and also create that emotional distance that comes with just looking at something that's in multiple corners of the page. Yeah, and I find that uh, so very interesting because I don't know that I've ever seen a poem um, done that way. Uh, to go along with that, another distancing technique that you use is uh, the geographic coordinates. Uh, instead of an address, a street name, or even a city name, people can obviously look up the coordinates, but I think in many ways the actual location is irrelevant. Uh, the locations are precise and obscured uh, through this method. Um, tell us a little bit about how you settled on the coordinates as the best way to identify space in the poem. Yeah, so initially with the first draft of this poem, I didn't have coordinates at all. Uh, in fact, each stanza just started with in this house and in this house in this house in this house. However, as I thought more about it, I wanted it to be very specific to what happened to me in each of those places, but I still wanted it to be 
vague enough where, you know, people don't actually really look up coordinates. And so I felt like it could be something that could be relatable for a lot of people and for them create an own, uh, their own geographical space with whatever happened to um, them in each of their locations, but still have something specific yet something that was general for the public. Yeah. And and I think that it works uh, in that way. Uh, And that that universality, uh, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, but I think global perspective uh, is one of those things that uh, is obviously important in your work. Uh, the book identifies your formative spaces as Korea, Tanzania, and the United States, uh, Boston specifically. Uh, while it is a very personal poem, um, in what ways do you see this as a universal poem? poem? Yeah, so like I mentioned, these childhood traumas, events that shape one's life, there are lots of things that can happen to someone. And so I feel like in this poem, many people can perhaps see their own experiences uh, reflected in each of the stanzas. And obviously not in the exact same ways, but perhaps as a general way, I think um, each of the stanzas perhaps represents something that uh, deals with sexual assault or death or illness or um, coming to terms with one's background that people can identify with. Yeah, I think that makes uh, a lot of sense. And and again, I, I just admire all the thought that went into crafting the poem beyond just the words uh, in, in the way that you've um, that you put it onto the page for us. In an interview with Serpentine Litzine, uh, you identified this poem, Holding On, as the most difficult one of the collection for you to write. Certainly with the subject matter, that's understandable. But I wonder if you could unpack for us what you did accomplish uh, in the Mm -hmm. poem and, and maybe something that you didn't or couldn't because of the difficult subject matter. Yeah, so with this poem, I think it just took a lot of energy and effort on my part to reflect on my past. But in doing so, I was able to come to terms with those experiences and appreciate how those events shaped me into who I am today. And so for me, it was almost a therapeutic opportunity for me to think back and write and reflect on these, knowing that hopefully other people might be able to relate to this and also come to terms with their childhood trauma. Um, And I think something that I wish I could have done better was use even more vivid imagery, more um, descriptions. But when it comes to this poem, I feel like I just didn't have the emotional energy to do so. However, I think on the other hand, by keeping the language fairly simple, very straightforward, very direct, hopefully I keep things um, very, you know, straightforward and to the point, uh, because that's how those events were. And especially since these events happened to me as a child, I wanted to kind of keep that vibe and energy of um, having language be straightforward and simple without too much vivid descriptions that take away from the events themselves. Yeah, and I think that that simplicity it has many facets to it because it also is um, is another layer of distancing. You know, mm-hmm. you, you don't want to to see. You know, you, you see you have purple. You know, mentioned at one point, but for the most part, it's a colorless kind of poem. Uh, you know, as if the you know a person has blanched and the blood is drained from their face because they're dealing with with such um, traumatic events. Um, and I, so I, I think that that strategy, um, that that simplicity of language, you know, has uh, multiple ways that it works well in the poem. Uh, so another another key word, um, Matic Echo, in a review of the chat book at Tent Journal, identifies displacement as the central theme of the book, and displacement occurs in thousands of circumstances. In this particular poem. The displacement is emotional, and I think we've said that uh, earlier, um, because especially in that first stanza, the physical displacement does not occur. You know, the boy continues to come over to play. Um, I, I wonder if you could talk about strategies of emotional displacement, um, and in relation to the poem, 
particularly how effective they are? Yeah, so I think going back with what I said earlier, that emotional detachment probably speaks a lot in terms of that emotional detachment that um, is a part of the poem itself and the experiences that I went through. Um, and then if you look at the stanzas themselves, the first three stanzas occur in a fairly similar geographical location. Um, they all happen in the south and the east in a very close proximity area. But then with the last stanza, we come and are um, have gone through a time shift as well as a locational shift very, very far. And I think um, I hope to achieve that sort of emotional displacement as well as physical and geographical displacement um, and those experiences in the stanzas and um, each of the words and the sections themselves. Yeah, uh, that ending. Uh... It, it focuses on lying to oneself and, and you, you see that, you know, not knowing how to cope uh, in the earlier three stanzas. Um, but you say that you need to lie to yourself to feel better for just a little longer. Um, but that phrase is also written in the past tense, suggesting that the little longer is a time that's also passed, uh, mm -hmm. that the effect of lying to oneself can't be sustained. Mm -hmm. um, is that a viable way of reading the ending of the poem? Or, or rather, what do you hope a reader might take from the poem, especially in that ending? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's precisely right. So when it comes to coming to terms with past experiences, I feel like you can only lie to oneself for so long. And so for me personally, I have to, like I said, come to terms with those experiences to actually be able to feel better. And that feel better from the past tense became um, not a reality to an actual reality. And so I hope that other readers can get that out of the poem and also realize that eventually they'll have to face whatever they went through in order to move forward and move past those things. Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, sound sound advice as difficult as it is you know in the midst of trauma to to want to face that um as always let me end by asking is there anything you would like to add to help us appreciate the poem more fully uh, actually to be really honest dan you came up with really great questions so i feel like i don't really have anything to add but uh, thank you uh for that i appreciate it um this has been a good discussion uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Melanie holds degrees from Gordon College and Emerson College. She is co-editor-in-chief at Flora Fiction. Her work has appeared in such places as Red Planet Magazine and Chakalaka Review. You can learn more at her website, melaniehan.com. For Peer Glass Poetry, I'm Stan Galloway, wishing you a poetic day. <laughs>